Hi, I'm Bob Newport and this is yet another in my series of videos made for my local branch of the U3A. This one is on colour. It's in two parts. I have no idea how long each part is going to be yet but um, we'll see how we go. Well here we are, um, the title slide and surprise surprise this is part one. Um, I've put a few contact details down at the bottom of the slide there. I'll repeat those and of course um, you'll be able to find those uh, whenever you look on, on the web anyway. Um, you've presumably come across this by looking at the blog site. And there it is, top of the page. This is the blog post that acts essentially as a contents page for all of the videos in this particular series uh, that I've done. This is the, um, the third video series. You can find me on Twitter as well, um, and um, you've already found me on YouTube, but the, uh, the address is down there uh, if you need it uh, for my whole family of, of videos. And wherever you see that cartoon character there, you'll, um, you'll know that it's something that's come from this particular stable. Um, I probably should point out that my background here um, is, uh, is actually the view from my study where I'm making these videos. Not today, uh, but um, this was about a month ago, one morning, really rather nice colours in the sky. So it seemed to go well with the topic of this, uh, this video. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to try and um, cover quite a wide and varied ground. So I want to look at some hard, objective, uh, physics-y type views of, of what colour is, but I also want to look at issues of perception as well. And actually there's a great deal we can learn uh, from um, people in the past who've, who've gone down that route. So the, uh, the physicist's favourite person, as it were, when it comes to talking about colour, certainly the name you'll see mostly in textbooks and so on, um, is Isaac Newton. And um, he's given us some incredibly valuable tools for thinking about the science of colour. But there are other people who've um, had a close look at what colour means as well. And I really want to spend quite a lot of time, particularly in the second video in the series, looking at, um, at what came out of their perspective. So here are our three principal characters. Um, Isaac Newton at the top of the screen there, um, really famous natural scientist uh, and did an awful lot of work uh, defining most of the concepts that school and indeed university textbooks uh, will still use today. But then we get down to um, Goethe, uh, lower left there, and Goethe was, uh, you know, he came along after uh, Newton, but he took a profoundly different view of what colour is and how it originated actually in nature. And there are some startling observations that he came up with which never get into physics textbooks uh, but actually if you look at them quite closely with uh, with modern eyes uh, he elucidated an awful lot of aspects about colour and particularly our perception of colour um, that um, you know we really sort of take for granted now in in other contexts and the other chap I want to bring in is, is J.M.W. Turner, um, so, you know, particularly uh, well-known British artist, of course, lots of landscapes and some amazing colour uh, interpretations. Um, Turner was really quite taken with Goethe's view of things and actually read English translations of Goethe's work, uh, which was, you know, the, written in, in German originally. Uh, and I thought it'd be fun towards the end of part two just to have a look at ways in which we can, we can have a look at Turner's paintings and see the influence of um, natural philosophers um, like Goethe. 
So here's our visible spectrum. These are the colours of the rainbow um, from um, red at one end uh, through yellows, oranges, greens, blues and so on. Um, you know, we've all got little acronyms for um, reciting what the colours of the rainbow are. But this is quite a, an interesting place to start in the sense that what you see before you um, is a, uh, a continuity, I mean quite literally a spectrum of colour uh, moving gradually from red at one end to violet at the other. Uh, there are no hard and fast boundaries between the different regions of this visible spectrum. Um, and in fact, in, in uh, you know, in, in Newton's time, people would have thought of this in terms of five colours, not seven. So our interpretation, our perception of these colours has actually varied uh, in relatively recent times, in fact. But, you know, it's useful. It's a useful place to start. But we need to see, you know, what's, what's out there beyond the visible spectrum. So down at the bottom of the screen here, uh, you can see that I've got the colours that I showed you on the previous slide. So, you know, red through to violet again. These are the colours that we can see with our eyes. So our light detectors are OK at these wavelengths and, and the wavelengths are written down at the bottom. They're written in units of nanometers and a nanometer is a thousand millionth of a metre. So these are quite small values, but um, in the scheme of things, actually not that small, uh, as I'll, I'll show you in a, session, in a second. If we have a look at this visible part of the spectrum, it actually occupies this tiny band in a much broader range of light wavelengths. So You'll all have heard, I think, probably of infrared. So if you hold the back of your hand against a, um, uh, towards a heated radiator or a fire or, you know, anything hot, you'll be able to sense uh, warmth coming from it even before you touch it. Uh, and that, of course, is because in your skin you have heat sensitive nerve endings. And what they're picking up actually is infrared. The warmth that we feel from the sun, for instance, is, is very much the infrared radiation coming from it. Uh, and these have longer wavelengths. So you can see down here there's a, a, a few hundred nanometers. So out here, you know, into the infrared we're already at a thousand nanometers and then we got to get to really long wavelengths. So, you know, we're out at a tenth of a millimeter out here still in the infrared band. And we go further than that and we get into the radio wave area. So, you know, radar microwaves actually slip in here. The microwaves in our um, kitchens have a wavelength of about three centimetres. So, you know, they're, um, they're sitting in here somewhere. Um, and our TV, our FM radios will have wavelengths of about a metre. Uh, and the old style um, amplitude modulated radio waves so I'm going back to old style long wave radio sets now the sort of thing that I still am able to pick up on the valve radio that I've got operating in my garage uh, we're out at you know a hundred meters for instance um, the old um, home service from the BBC way back actually had a wavelength of 1500 meters so one and a half kilometers huge wavelengths. But we can go out the other side of our visible spectrum as well. So out the other side beyond violet we get to ultraviolet and now the wavelengths are actually getting shorter. So we're going down now from hundreds of nanometers down to um, you know in the region of 10 nanometers for instance. And again our bodies can detect ultraviolet even though our eyes can't. Uh, we don't want to be doing a lot of that because actually this is what causes damage in your skins uh, when you get um, sunburn. So we're detecting ultraviolet through the damage that it's doing in our skin. So as I say, it's not a, not a recommended pastime. But there are some 
uh, creatures in the animal kingdom, so some birds, for instance, uh, and certainly insects that can see ultraviolet light. So, you know, the little bit just beyond violet in the spectrum, they don't see the whole range of it, but they can certainly see this, uh, this region up here. So they get a completely different view of the world uh, to the one that our eyes afford us. If we go out this side beyond ultraviolet, we get into x-rays. Uh, so shorter wavelengths still, and there's a sort of visual representation above just to give you a, a handle on this. And beyond x-rays, we have gamma rays, so the things that can come out of radioactive materials or come into us from, from outer space, for instance. We'll have a lot of gamma rays. Uh, cosmic rays are just a version of gamma rays. So again, really short uh, wavelengths here. So what we see with our eyes is actually a tiny, tiny fraction of the light that's out there. But it's this small fraction that I'm going to focus on uh, in these videos, because obviously that's what we understand as human beings uh, to be um, at the back of all the colours that we look at, our entire perception of colour in the world. Now, Newton's um, very much reductionist physical science approach um, was amazing uh, and still is. And as I said earlier on, we've got a lot of incredibly useful stuff that's come out of it. So he conducted some really rather clever experiments, uh, basically around the use of, of prisms um, to split up the, uh, the colours of, of you know, natural light, light coming from the sun, um, and actually then to recombine those colours and prove that you could add them together to produce uh, white light again. So some really, really clever stuff. Um, and by that, he essentially came out with what we understand now when we study physics at school or at university as um, the different wavelengths of colour and how they correspond one to another. And as far as Newton was concerned, indeed as far as most um, you know, students are concerned, darkness is, is simply the absence of light. So take that light away, that's what darkness is. Um, I make this point now, it sounds intuitively fairly obvious, but actually when we come to look at um, Goethe's approach to all of this, uh, his view of, of darkness was, was actually profoundly different. So remember that, when we get to video two that will be an important, uh, important thing. So a lot of the stuff that we talk about now uh, in terms of uh, of light, so the fact that it bends when it goes into swimming pools, for instance, uh, the fact that we can get the colours coming out of a prism when we shine um, white light into one side, all that sort of stuff we can explain really quite easily and readily uh, with Newton's, uh, Newton's theories. So let's have a look at a prism. Um, it was important to Isaac Newton. It's quite a useful tool for us in terms of understanding what's going on. Um, what happens with a prism and indeed any uh, material is that it will bend light. It's, uh, the technical word for this is that it will refract the light. Um, now, the key point here is that how much the light is bent uh, depends on something called the refractive index. So that's a property of the material uh, and glass has a refractive index of around uh, 1.5. Uh, water, on the other hand, is a little bit less than that. It's 1.3, so it tends to bend light a little bit less uh, than glass does. Uh, diamond, however, is really high. 2.4 um, and that higher number is telling me that it's um, really excellent as a material for bending, for changing the direction uh, of the light that's passing through it and in fact this high refractive index is what makes diamonds sparkle. 
it's actually intrinsic um, to their um, their beauty and therefore value as a material. Uh, it takes a little bit of diamond to bend the light a lot, basically. Um, so we can get, you know, different colours coming out and so on, um, depending on how the diamond is cut. Uh, and it'll look a, a really attractive material. Now, key point here is that each colour has a slightly different refractive index. So, in, in other words, red light going through a glass prism is refracted, bent, um, slightly differently to blue light going through. Okay, one is bent more or less than the other uh, because they've got different wavelengths. Uh, and in fact, the refractive index is defined as a quantity that is proportional to uh, the speed of the light going through. And actually that varies depending on the color. Uh, again, it's one of those things you'll see in physics textbooks. Uh, the speed of light is constant, it's just shorthand. Actually, it's only constant in a vacuum. The speed of light changes when it goes through any material. Um, so as it goes through glass, the speed of light changes. That's actually what causes the bending. Uh, and that change depends upon the wavelength of the light, depends on the colour of the light going through. I've written down here, we'll have a closer look at this later on, but hopefully you can see it in the other webcam. Uh, the refractive index is proportional to 1 over the speed of the light in whatever medium it is, so glass, say. And the refractive index of the violet end of the visible spectrum is actually greater, only a little bit, but it's greater than the refractive index at the red end of our spectrum. So you can see that um, violet light uh, is going to be bent more as it goes through the prism than the red light. And actually that in a prism is what gives us the spread of colours that we get. But we can see refraction taking place uh, in nature in all sorts of different places. Uh, and waves on water are a, a good example of this. So let's have a look at something local to us. So this is a photograph I took some years ago um, towards Whitstable from uh, the area of, of Tankerton Slopes. And in particular uh, from, you know, what the locals will know and love as the street, which is essentially a land spit that's exposed at, um, at low tide. So here we have running along here, this is the street. And of course, by definition now, the uh, depth of the water is changing as we go off the side of the street uh, into the sea to either side. So I'm, I'm, I've drawn on here um, a few waves. I mean, this was a relatively smooth day. It was easier to take the picture on a day like this. But the direction of, of wave motion in general is as shown over here. It's, it's where this line is going. But as the depth of the water changes, the direction of the wave changes. So actually it begins to curve around as we get to shallower and shallower water. And that's refraction. We have refracted these seawater waves um, because their refractive index actually depends upon the depth of water underneath them. Um, certainly when it's, you know, getting uh, very shallow, you will not see anything noticeable from, you know, the continental shelf to the middle of the ocean. That's not the point. But when we've got this gradation of depth uh, now to zero, we get a very pronounced refraction effect. The direction of wave motion is changing. So we can pop out, uh, well, you know, after lockdown, we can pop out to uh, the North Kent coast and, and see this in action. But let's go back to our prism. Uh, this is the classic setup. There is, uh, there's white light coming in uh, on one face. And because of this 
refraction effect because each of the wavelengths of light, each of the colours of light, uh, is bent slightly differently uh, because its refractive index, uh, the refractive index of the glass, I should say, uh, depends upon the wavelength of light going through the colour. Uh, so we get our spectrum of colours spread out on the other side. So it's relatively easy to see. Uh, here's uh, the red end of the spectrum bent less than uh, the blue and violet end of the spectrum, uh, exactly as, uh, as we said earlier. So I'm going to try a simple experiment uh, just to demonstrate this for you. Uh, I'll switch over to the other camera. It's a little tricky to set up, um, so we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. But the essence of this is that I've got a red and a green laser pointer, and I'm going to make sure that they're pointing in the same direction, that they're parallel to one another when we start, simply because I'm going to strap them to a piece of wood. In the photograph here it was a ruler. Uh, in fact, for the demonstration I've got here, it's, uh, it's just a length of, of balsa wood. Uh, the prism is the same, and it's a very cheap one. It's just perspex, it's not even a glass prism. But hopefully uh, it will demonstrate for you um, what I've just been claiming uh, is the case earlier on. So let's switch over and have a look. Okay, so I'm actually going to try this on the um, desktop because the white paper is a little bit too refractive. It's, um, it's going to dazzle us. So here's green and red both lining up with one another, one just directly above the other. So if I put the prism in the way, um, let's see what we can get. Okay, so you can see now over to the right, prism in, sorry, let's get this right, the green has moved further than the red. Okay, so they're lined up one above the other and then put the prism in, green has travelled further as it's been refracted through the prism. Okay, so I hope that demonstrates let me move it down here. So here we are. Red sitting above the green uh, on the desktop. Slip the prism in and you'll notice that the green is actually refracted more than the red. It's moved further away. Okay, so sitting one above the other with the prism out, put the prism in and are refracted green has travelled further, it's been bent further than the red. So I hope that demonstrates the principle for you in this really simple and, um, and crude fashion with a couple of, of laser pointers here. So let's switch back to the slides now uh, and see where we go next. Um, let me just point these out to you uh, before we go, just in case you didn't see them in the smaller uh, window. Here's our refractive index eta proportional to 1 over the speed of the light that's going through the medium. And that speed, remember, depends upon the colour, the wavelength of the light. And that means that the refractive index for the violet end of our visible spectrum is greater than the refractive index of the red end of the spectrum. So the further you go away from red, the more it's bent, in other words. I only had a green and a red laser pointer, so we had to make do with that. Anyway, let's go back to the slides uh, and see where we go next. So here's a spectrum that I photographed on the um, carpet under my feet, in fact. Uh, this is just sunlight falling on the prism as it sat on the uh, on the windowsill um, and it shows how we can split sunlight up very conveniently even with a cheap uh, perspex prism and you can find this effect in all sorts of places in the house all we need is something that behaves like a prism so the edge of a tumbler for instance I spotted this uh, in my kitchen 
uh, a while back the sun was um, if you got the angle right the sun was just hitting the edge uh, of this tumbler and you can see that by holding my phone um, at one angle I'm definitely getting the blue end of the spectrum I only had to move my phone just a little bit and we end up getting the red end of the spectrum and we could get everything in between so anything that has um, something that behaves like a prism so the flat top of the glass on this tumbler will give you precisely the same effect so you better find this all over your house uh, this is probably not something to boast about but there are um, I'm afraid the previous owner of our house left some scratches on some of the window panes um, getting a little bit too aggressive scraping things off I guess um, and just the edges of the scratches are enough that they behave like prisms so we can get uh, these gradations of light, uh, light colour caused by the sun hitting the scratches on the windows. Really doesn't take much to split the light up in this way. Well where's the other place we see all this? Of course we see it in rainbows. Um, that's um, one of our go-to everyday examples uh, of, um, of the colours, uh, colours of the rainbow after all. And what's happening here is another example of refraction. So we've got sunlight coming in uh, to the atmosphere. Um, it's hitting drops of water uh, up in the air, raindrops in other words. Um, I've just picked out this one amazing water drop on the screen here. And we're getting light going from one material, air, into another one, water. And so we're going to get this process of refraction taking place. Right now, remember the the blue end of the spectrum, the violet end of the spectrum, is going to be refracted more, so it's going to be bent as it goes into this water drop because its speed has changed. S likewise, the red, but it's going to be bent a little bit less. So here's the red end of our spectrum of visible light colours. Here's the blue end, and they're going to hit this back face of the raindrop and be reflected. This is going to behave a bit like a mirror. Um, so this will come off, you know what happens at mirrors, uh, the angle that it comes in at is the angle it comes off. Um, so that will just come down here and then we get refraction happening again because we're going from one medium, water, now into another one, air. So we're going back out to air again. So we actually get um, another refraction effect taking place at this boundary here between the water and the air. But we've separated our colours look. We've still got uh, the violet end of the spectrum separated from the red end of the spectrum. And that's just going to scoot all the way down to wherever our eyeballs happen to be. And we will see the colours spread out from this one giant raindrop. Uh, in this case and it's quite a big spread so you know the the angle between the sunlight coming in and the violet light coming out is about 40 degrees it's two degrees greater for the red end of the spectrum so we really have separated out these colors uh, in the way that we said now of course we don't get rainbows um, in everyday life from giant single giant raindrops in the sky uh, we get stuff coming from um, thousands tens of thousands millions of raindrops so we've still got our light coming in uh, and we've got all the colors all the wavelengths of visible light being refracted being bent in each of the raindrops okay so now it just depends on where our eye is. Uh, what we see now is light coming off from all of these different raindrops uh, in this particular direction. So everything that's coming off at 42 degrees is going to be red light. So depending on which raindrop it is, we will see red light. Uh, it'll be another raindrop where the violet light comes off at 40 degrees 
but still ends up at our eyeballs. All right, and we see this curve, curve of the rainbow, because this is happening. You know, it's not just 40 degrees in one direction, it's 40 degrees all the way round, as it were, from the raindrop. Um, so we get a cone of light coming off. We can only see the bit above ground, of course, naturally. But provided we've got these angles right, we will see from all the different raindrops in our one small detector, the retina in our eye, we will see all of the colours. So the red colours would have come from one particular group of raindrops. The blue colours will have come from another group of raindrops because that's coming off at a different angle. And we need all of those to coincide on the retina of our eye. Okay, so it's a fairly simple and complex process depending on how good your imagination is for this sort of stuff. But this also explains why you never get to the end of the rainbow to find a pot of gold. Uh, because as you run towards the end of the rainbow, so you are seeing, and I'm just showing the red part of the rainbow colours uh, in this diagram, but as you run along you've always got to keep this angle of 42 degrees between your eyeball and wherever the sun is. All right? That's the only relationship where refraction of the sunlight in a water droplet will give you red. All right? It's 40 degrees for violet, remember, and then all this gradation in between. Uh, so if you move to a different place, you've still got to get that 40 degree angle. So it's still going to look like the rainbow is ahead of you. And as you run, as you run forwards, so the rainbow essentially moves away from you until you run out of raindrops, you get the other side of the rainstorm, and then the rainbow disappears altogether. Um, so this is why you can never ever define where the end of the rainbow is because it depends where you're standing looking at the raindrops at the time. Everything just depends on this 42 degree angle um, and wherever you are you're going to be seeing red coming from raindrops uh, that give this 42 degree angle between the position of the sun and the position of your eye. So that's a bit disappointing really, isn't it? But there we are. Um, you can demonstrate this with a single drop of water. Uh, it's entirely possible to do. If you look back at my Physics in the House video series, um, I try an experiment there where I suspend a single drop of water and just with the camera on my mobile phone, um, I can demonstrate that we see the different colours as we move around this water drop. You may have seen it with dew on um, grass or leaves, for instance. If you get the angle just right between your eyeball, the drop of water and the sun, uh, then you can see the rainbow colours coming from the single drop. We can do it in a more controlled way using something called a spectrometer. You might remember these from your school days. I don't know, but basically it's um, you know light coming in, shining on whatever we stuck on this sample table here and then we look through this small telescope at what's coming out the other side. So if we get this angle right, so if we had a water droplet in the middle there, if the angle between this and this was 40 degrees we'd see red. If it was 42 degrees uh, we'd see violet. So all we'd need to do is to suspend a single water droplet here, so you know from the end of a pipette or a syringe, something like that. And all we're getting with a rainbow um, out in nature, as it were, is just, you know, millions of these all adding together to produce this giant effect uh, up in the sky, uh, rather than something that you can only see by uh, moving your telescope around uh, on the spectrometer. So that's brought us to the end of part one. Uh, have a break, have a rest, have a cup of tea. 
um, and then come back and watch part two and we'll pick up the story there. Bye.